And now, please welcome our moderator, Adva Saldinger. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm excited to welcome you all to this panel about the sharing economy. But before we get started, I wanted to introduce you to a couple uh, commitment makers. So first, I wanted to invite Salman Hirani from the Icon School of Medicine out on the stage. One of the challenges um, that people face, especially elderly, disabled, and injured people in the world face today is, an ac is accessing health care services. Uh, often transportation is costly and inefficient or unreliable or discriminates against them. Several transportation services offer them rides, but a lot of them fail to comply with the American for with Disabilities Act. So Salman has created Wheelshare. Uh, it's a commitment that's designed to increase access to transit. It was originally designed to increase uh, access to paratransit services through ride-sharing companies, and they're partnered uh, together with the Harvard Medical School and the Mount Sinai Medical School and the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital to create a training platform for ride-share drivers. But after market research showed that bringing services to those drivers was actually a better solution than trying to address the transportation issue, uh, the partnership was, re was redesigned, and so the commitment is now called Patch. It recruits physical and mental health providers in New York and Boston to provide patients with comprehensive health care at home. Patch seeks to bring patients to their prior level of functioning with less stress, time, and money spent on transportation. Pilot programs underway in New York and one in Boston is coming soon. Um, they've recruited about 30 therapists that are committed to providing home service to patients, and patients have also begun signing on. Uh, going forward, they hope to expand uh, throughout the country in an effort to reduce the difficult office and hospital visits and enhance the quality of patient and provider interactions. Now I'd like to welcome Yasin Sherbaji and Lucas Karen Shack out on the stage. They both go to the University of Oklahoma, and, and, and the challenge that they were looking at is that undergraduate students on campuses across the country are among the millions of Americans who are dealing with food insecurity. Um, and those students often struggle to stay focused on academics and complete their degrees. And so they have uh, started an initiative, their commitment is called Swipe to Share, and it was started at the University of Oklahoma and designed to address food insecurity on campus and, the, and for the homeless population in the surrounding area. So Swipe to Share hosts a campus drive at the end of each school year to collect students' unused meal points that would otherwise expire. Those points are then converted into food purchases um, that are donated to students and to homeless shelters. Uh, all the donations are non-monetary, they're made in person by the students, and then the items to be donated are purchased through a university-affiliated convenience store. Over the next year, Swipe to Share is going to establish branches at the University of Central Oklahoma, the University of Tulsa, and at Texas Tech University. With this expansion, they expect uh, about 30% of unused points at those campuses to be donated, and that, that will amount to about $60,000 worth of $60,000 worth of donated goods in 2019. Congratulations. So now I'm going to welcome out onto the stage our panelists who are going to be with us for the next hour. So I'd like to welcome Diana Telefson Torres, who's the executive director of the UFW Foundation, and, Ar and Arun Sundarajan, who is the professor of business at NYU. Welcome. So we're here this afternoon to talk about the sharing economy. And the sharing economy is a somewhat new and emerging part of, of our world. Um, 
And it's sort of this idea of peer-to-peer -peer activity around obtaining, giving, or sharing access to goods and services. It's a way for individuals and groups um, to make money from underutilized assets that they might have. Um, people often talk about an origin story of the sharing economy coming around the idea of um, you know, sharing a drill among neighbors, right? So this idea that if, if I have a drill um, and my neighbor needs one, instead of going out and buying one, maybe using the technology as it's advanced, they could just borrow it um, from someone in their community. Um, and, and while many of sort of the early companies in this space failed, there are also some now that are growing rapidly and increasing in size. Um, certainly the ones that you probably might think of first are the Ubers and the Airbnbs of the world. Um, a report published last year by the Brookings Institution uh, said that they expected the sharing economy to grow from what was about $14 billion in 2014 to about $335 billion in 2025. And so as this, as this economy grows and evolves, it raises a lot of questions. And so we're here today to talk about some of those questions and try to answer some of them. Um, and I'm gonna throw it first to Arun. He has literally written the book about the sharing economy, so we're very fortunate to have him with us today. So I was hoping you could talk us through a little bit um, about sort of how this, how this works. What, what does a business that engages in the sharing economy look like? Um, what, what are sort of the requirements for a business in this space to succeed? Okay, um, well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Um, you know, despite the fact that I spend a lot of time um, talking to students in my full-time job, um, there's nothing I enjoy doing more than talking to large groups of promising students, especially ones who sort of want to change the world the way you guys do. So I'm um, delighted to be here. Um, you know, it's, 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 hard to, um, it's hard to put a sort of a, you know, a specific definition on the sharing economy, um, even though I have in my book, because, um, because people use the word to mean different things. Um, like, you know, the conception, like, you know, the, the phrase is an unfortunate one in some sense because um, it had its roots in, you know, efforts that were meant to share assets, but sort of has taken on a sort of a fairly different flavor where like, you know, the connection to sharing is tenuous at best in many business models. And so the pattern that I see across a lot of these businesses, whether it's ride hailing, um, you know, sort of short term accommodation through Airbnb, um, but also a whole bunch of like, you know, other industries is um, one that, you know, we, we, we move away from the model of organizing economic activity that we got used to in the 20th century, like the second half of the 20th century, where a large organization employs people full time and delivers goods and services to consumers. This um, is a familiar model to us, but it's a relatively recent one. I mean, 200 years ago, a vast majority of commerce was individual to individual. That's why when you um, open up your microeconomics textbook, how many of you have taken a microeconomics course? How many of you enjoyed it? <laughs> okay, well, we've got this is you, you. You are, you know, you're, you're you're far more positive about microeconomics than my typical audience. So I'll give you that. Um, but you know, people are often disappointed when they read the description of the economy because it's about individuals transacting with other individuals, and it doesn't resemble the economy that we in, we deal with. And that's because that's what it was in the late 18th century. And then we sort of went through mass production, distribution sort of created this new industrial economy. But what I see the sharing economy representing is sort of creating a new hybrid between this 20th century industrial model and the 18th century market model, where um, you've got platforms that sit between consumers who want goods and services. They aggregate their demand. They provide some kind of search and discovery. <clears throat> they may provide some kind of digital trust. But then the actual supply of stuff, whether it's money through a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, whether it's um, money to buy a share of your company through a crowdfunding platform, whether it's philanthropic dollars through something like Kickstarter, whether it's content for entertainment through a platform like YouTube, a car that you want to rent through a platform like Get Around or Turo, 
a seat in someone's car from one city to another through a platform like Blah Blah Car, um, food that you want to buy through a platform like La Rouge Kiravi, it, 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 they all come from the room that you want to stay in through Airbnb. They all come from a distributed and heterogeneous crowd of individuals. Um, some of them are big companies, some of them are smaller companies, but a vast majority of them are individuals who are making a living through this. And so it's, um, this is really the signature of the sharing economy to me. And it, by, by creating this sort of new way of organizing economic activity, <clears throat> it raises a number of challenges because it blurs the lines between personal and professional in the provision of commercial services. Your Airbnb host isn't trained to be a hotelier, your Lyft driver is not trained to be a taxi driver, um, your get around car rental owner is sort of doing this on the side. Um, <clears throat> the person whose dining table you're having a meal at through one of these supper clubs is not a professional chef. You know, we don't know what the state of their kitchen is. I mean, there, there are all these, all these issues. And, you know, we've set up our regulatory systems in most sort of industrialized economies to expect a large company on the other end, and now you've got all these individuals. Um, it also blurs the lines between casual labor and full-time work. Um, and so we, you know, because of changes induced by the sharing economy, but also because of changes induced by um, digital technologies that sort of often fall under the artificial intelligence and robotics umbrella, um, that model that we've gotten used to of working as a full-time employee is going to become increasingly challenged over the next couple of decades. And um, <clears throat> what we're seeing in the sharing economy may be early examples of a new way of earning a living. Um, but maybe we can get to that sort of later in the conversation. But, but this, this is the pattern um, that you sort of like crowd-based networks replace centralized hierarchies. There's a lot more peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Um, a platform which is a hybrid between a firm and a market produces, sort of aggregates demand and provides trust. And there's a blurring of lines between markets and hierarchies between personal and professional and between casual labor and full-time work. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things that I want us to talk a little bit about is this issue of trust, um, because these platforms are really sort of dependent on on trust in many ways. I think um, because of the way that the economy has worked, people have, have placed trust in these big corporations. So when you disrupt that system and you have <coughs> a new system, how do you create those mechanisms of trust? And in some ways, can the sharing economy provide, you know, can it, you know, enable new platforms that would create different types of mechanisms for creating trust? And so that's a question I think I'll pose to both of you because I know with farm workers, you're looking at using digital platforms um, to do some really interesting work that would also connect them more directly with consumers. So I think part of, um Part of what the framework that we're looking at, the shared economy and the farm worker movement, is really looking at what is the value that farm workers are able to provide throughout the food chain. And so when we're looking at the food chain, we're looking um, all the way from a, a consumer to the big buyers, the retailers, such as like a Costco or a Walmart. Um, the growers and between the folks who own the land and, and have the, the labels and the companies. Um, but, you know, for farm workers, for a very long time, the lack of access of information has been a real challenge. And that's, it, it runs the gamut as far as, you know, farm workers mainly are immigrants in this country in particular. And so many of them don't know the social constructs are coming into the country not knowing a lot of information. Um, if you're a guest worker under the H-2A guest worker pro program here in the US, you might be and, and most likely will have um, been potentially defied when you're talking about coming into the US, you're told by the recruiter all these wonderful things about what you may be coming into and sometimes don't have a contract um, you don't really know where you're going to be going in the U.S., and sometimes you're signing on to trafficking or indentured servitude. And so we know that information is key. And the trust piece on the ground when you're in a very isolated rural area, 
you count on those that you know, other workers who have potentially worked with a specific employer and they're telling you, you know what, don't go work there. And so what we're trying to figure out is how can we create um, new models, new organizations and platforms where workers can get the information that they need because ultimately what we want is to improve the lives of farm workers. But in the end, we also know that this model of shared economy is also built on, it, the hallmark is transparency, right? So when you're going to an Airbnb, you know, someone is saying what their experience was like you know, was the place clean, et cetera. And so when we look at agriculture, the consumer knows very little about where their food is coming from. The consumer knows very little about how the worker is being treated. The consumer doesn't know whether the three or four dollars they spent on a strawberries, what percentage of that pie that you paid <coughs> goes directly to the worker who actually first touched that strawberry. And so we're looking, I mean, and frankly, we're, we're trying to figure it out, right? So we're looking at potentially, um, uh, we're designing an, an app where farm workers are the ones that are telling us what they're seeing on the ground. So in essence, you have a farm worker who's able to tell you on an app what, um, whether they were provided with clean water that day, whether there was shade provided to them. You know, in the Central Valley in California, farm workers are working in 100, 105 degree weather um, all throughout the summertime. And now we have a, a heat regulation that we um, basically had to sue the state of California to be able to get where shade has to be provided. Well, unless the regulation um, agency from the government comes and checks to see whether there's shade, you really wouldn't know. So really, instead of having a third party auditor come and check a farm to see if everything's there, whether they have bathrooms or not, you have this, um, I would call it like a Yelp for farm workers, right? Where a consumer could look and see, well, oh, I wonder about this farm. Well, 50 farm workers have said that they're not treated very well, that they're only paying them below minimum wage, et cetera, et cetera. And so really being able to provide more transparency in the industry is something that we're really interested in. Um, and in addition to that, um, retailers, and big buyers like a Costco or a Trader Joe's, et cetera, that information is really valuable to them yeah. because they're also, they, <clears throat> they don't want any liabilities. They don't want to get sued, like Costco got sued um, because there was slavery um, in the shrimp industry in Thailand. You know, they don't want to get sued. They don't want their consumers to blame them for any slavery or, or uh, bad working conditions. So their interest is that workers are being treated well on the ground. So we're really looking at the shared uh, economy concept or model as a way to make a system more transparent throughout so that consumers have information about what's going on on the ground, but also it could be related to food safety issues. The value that farm workers have is they really know, they're professionals at this work, so they I, um, can provide information about like, you know what, I actually saw an animal near this specific crop. We probably shouldn't be picking this specific crop here. They, they know about issues of food safety. And so if workers are being treated well and they're being trained to identify those things, that's information gathering that can be useful data for the industry. And so how do we utilize that to improve, improve the system and make farm workers' lives better? I mean, I think that that's <clears throat> that, that's absolutely critical. I think that that's um, you know uh, both informal um, reputation systems uh, that you know are generating information can 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 cause like tremendous behavior changes among the farms. Um, I've seen this happen with other platforms created to like you know allow freelance workers to say, "Well, this person stiffed me." And then simply that's a big deterrent to sort of, you know, because 70% of freelance workers, from what I've understood, at some point in their um, career have not been paid. Um, 
But I think there's, there's is a huge issue in farm yeah, labor. Yeah. It's, but but there's there's another side to this as well, right? Which is um, that um, we are also on the consumer side um, witnessing a. I mean, on on the worker side, I think that this is going to become important over you know in other industries. Um, as our model of work shifts from being I work for this company full time for a salary and towards I run my own tiny business through this platform. Um, but you know, right now um, on the consumer side, um, I feel like we're witnessing the emergence of a new model of commercial trust. Right? I mean, because um, if you think about the history of trust, um, you know, um, many hundreds of years ago, most commercial transactions were between people who knew each other. Um, you didn't trust the person in the neighboring village enough to buy their milk because you didn't know if it was real milk or something else, so you bought from people in your village. Government standards against adulteration, weights and measures, these were the first kinds of, you know, sort of national trust infrastructures. And then along came institutions, courts, contracts, property rights. That expanded trade further. Over the last 50 years in many um, countries like the United States, Canada, Western Europe, Japan, um, brand has taken over as the primary form of consumer trust. And you go to Starbucks and you order your coffee. You don't sign a contract sort of on what the quality of the coffee is going to be. Um, you trust that the brand will sort of deliver a uniformly high quality experience because they want your business tomorrow. But so you've had sort of community, government, institutions, brand, and I feel we're in this sort of fifth phase of digital trust. And there's a company um, based in France called Blablaka um, that uh, most people smile when I say Blablaka. It's sort of, I like saying Blablaka. It sort of rolls off your tongue. Try saying it fast a few times, Blablaka. Um, but the, the name is funny, but this is, this, is an, this, this is an incredible success story in the sharing economy. How many of you have taken a ride in a Blablaka? Okay, so many of you know what I'm talking about. You buy a seat in someone else's car when they're driving from one city to another. And, um, you know, they rate them, you know, and it's, 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 it's amazing to me because Blablaka today carries twice as many people every day as Amtrak does, um, five times as many people every day in France as the Eurostar train network. And it's like they've built this digital trust infrastructure to be able to replicate um, what used to require steel and concrete infrastructure. This is what I think of as invisible infrastructure. And so I spent a couple of years working with them, trying to understand how did they manage to build this kind of trust, working with them as in like doing research with them. Because, uh, um, you know, when I was growing up, I was told, like, you know, don't get into a stranger's car and say, drive me to another city, um, you know, like, you know, in exchange for money, or don't pay them to, like, you know, drive you to another city. I was also told, don't sleep in a stranger's spare bedroom, like, you know, if you can avoid it. But um, so it seems like everything my mom told me is now sort of manifesting itself at scale in the sharing economy. But, you know, I, so I surveyed. Uh, um, Blablaka users in 11 different countries. I did this in collaboration with their sort of senior executive team to try and understand the levels of trust people have in different other people they interact with. Um, and we came up with a ranking based on our survey results and friends and family are still sort of the most trusted. Neighbors and colleagues are not quite as trusted. Um, things like social media contacts, nobody really trusts sort of like, you know, social media contact. But a blah blah car user who you don't know who has a full trust profile in each of these 11 countries is trusted more than neighbors and colleagues. Not quite at the level of friends and family, but higher than neighbors and colleagues. And so I have two theories that explain these results. Um, one is that people who are on the blah blah car platform just have really lousy neighbors and colleagues. This is why they're sort of getting into the blah blah cars and saying, drive me to another city. Um, but the, the, the other theory is that, um, you know, over the last decade, um, there's been a steady drop in our trust in institutions. There's been a steady drop in the general level of trust in society. But in parallel, we've gotten good at reading digital cues. The Yelp reviews that we've been reading for a decade, the TripAdvisor reviews, the Amazon reviews, we don't read these reviews the same. We each look for different things, but we've all sort of developed a certain level of confidence 
in assessing something that we aren't familiar with by relying on the digital trust cues of a platform. And so as our confidence has grown and as the, um, I guess the, um, the thickness of these platforms has grown, it's not just opinions of others, right? I mean, you've got their LinkedIn profile, their Facebook profile, you've got a digitized government ID, you've got information about is this person a blood donor? Um, like, you know, what's their mobile, do they have a verified mobile phone number? So certainly the information has gotten better, but our own confidence in, and our ability to sort of use this to make an assessment you know, because what is trust after all, right? It's like a willingness to commit to some sort of transaction before you know how the other person will behave. And so I think that that's, that's to me, sort of a shifting, and that that's actually why I got interested in the sharing economy in the first place, because, you know, I feel like if you understand the evolution of trust, you understand the evolution of business. Every time there's been a big change in commercial trust, there has been a fundamental reorganizing of the world's economic activity is part of why I sort of confidently assert these days that the sharing economy is not just a flash in the pan, that it does represent a new way of organizing economic activity that's gonna be a big part of, you know, sort of how we, how we organize things in the years to come. So, you know, I, I think the, the sharing economy does present a lot of interesting opportunities. It, I think, will transform the way some businesses operate. We're already seeing that. Um, but it's not necessarily all good. Right? I, think, I think we can't have a conversation about what, what is the sharing economy, is it sustainable, without talking about some of the potential downsides. What does it mean about the changing nature of work? What does that mean for workers' rights? Right? So, um, you know, if we're transitioning to a place where people are working on a contract basis and aren't full-time employees, what does that mean about the provision of benefits, of access to health care, of fair wages, and, and issues like that. And then what does it mean for the systems that some of these businesses disrupt, especially when they're public goods, like public transit systems? Yeah. Well, that's definitely a concern with the, the lens of the labor movement. Um, so I think, you know, the reality for farm workers is that in the last two decades, farm workers have been moving from being direct employees of um, of the folks who own the land of the grower, um, particularly because um, most of the employees are now uh, undocumented. The vast majority of farm workers are undocumented. They don't have legal status in this country. Um, and there's a lot of other issues. So there's these middle people, these farm labor contractors, that hire the workers directly. Oftentimes the workers don't even know what the name of their employer is, especially if they, they're paid by cash. Um, so we're already seeing this in the agricultural industry. And so when you look at um, the impact that, you know, an Uber or Lyft is having on taxi drivers, um, it's huge, right? So. There are taxi drivers that have to go through all of these different hurdles to be able to actually drive a taxi, um, insurance, et cetera. And um, I've talked to a lot of taxi drivers in, in the last couple of years. And every time I hop in a car, um, if it has to be Lyft because I'm somewhere remote or something, then um, you know, I, I'm always asking the, the driver, you know, how long are you working today? Um, and I get a lot of answers from Lyft drivers that they're working 10 to 12 hour days. Um, I often ask how many days a week um, and whether that's the, the f only employment that they have at that time. So I think on both ends, there are a lot of individuals who are able to get employment through this platform that they might not have had before, but at the same time at the cost of not being able to spend time with their families or have the types of medical benefits that would be provided um, from a taxi company when you're a direct employee. Uh, so that is a, a, a big concern of what what is it as this shared economy evolves we have to really think about shared responsibility. So what is the responsibility that we have as a society to ensure that someone who's working 
a full-time or more than full-time job is actually able to sustain their own families. So that's the viability of the economy and making sure that people have what they need, not only to be able to survive, but to be able to thrive. And so I think that that's, that's a, a huge question in economic viability for a country. I, I, I agree, um, absolutely. But see, the, the thing here is that, uh, um, you know, I, I mean, before we get to a solution, um, I think we have to change the language we use to describe work. Um, because I don't think that it's reasonable to try and go towards a future where we try, where we replicate um, the work models that existed in the second half of the 20th century. We still talk of work as jobs. We still talk of, um, you know, engagement with an institution as employment. But, you know, even in the United States, the reality of work today is that 20% of the workforce get all of their income from non-employment work arrangements, and a further 20% get part of their income, like you know, supplement the income from a regular job with non-employment work. And so the, the, the ground has already shifted. Um, and what I've seen in, like, you know, I've, I've spoken to literally probably like tens definitely of city governments about you know, employment issues um, relating to, like, you know, taxi drivers and Uber drivers. And um, in New York, for example, uh, you know, it, most taxi drivers aren't employees either. Um, they pay $130, they rent a hack license, and then they sort of get the car and they drive 12 hours. And so, um, at least in New York City, while, you know, I don't condone like, you know, I, I don't like the fact that we live in a society where people have to drive so long in order to sort of make a living wage. Um, I don't see a discernible difference between people driving yellow cabs and people driving Ubers um, in terms of like, you know, the returns that they get from their time. I think what ends up being like, you know, a way to think about how do we solve this problem um, is one to sort of think about what's, what's, what, what's sort of the, um, what used to happen in the second half of the 20th century? Who were the stakeholders who were responsible um, in this country? So in certain countries, you'll realize that the government provided a vast majority of the social safety net. In other countries like the US and the UK, you'll find that the employer shouldered a significant sort of like, you know, fraction of the burden of providing the safety net. Um, like the employer guaranteed income stability, they guaranteed health insurance, they provided paid vacations, even though they weren't mandated to by law. And what, what ends up being like, you know, a way towards the answer is to say, well, we may not have an institution like this who can step up and take on all of that responsibility. Because Airbnb does not have the same kind of relationship with their hosts that a hotel has with their workers. And so it's unreasonable to say, let's put Airbnb in the seat of the hotel. What we have to do instead is to invent a new funding model for these benefits, right? Because eventually it's all coming from the worker, right? You know, I mean, you get paid a salary and then you get all these benefits. It's not as if they're free. You're just getting paid less than you otherwise would have with all of this stuff wrapped around. And like, you know, we, we were talking about the jungle when, um, you know, we were chatting before. And this is a book by Upton Sinclair from like 100 years ago about the meatpacking district. And, you know, you read it and you get a sense for the fact that full-time employment did not come endowed with all these nice things wrapped around it. It looked pretty horrific 100 years ago. And it was through sort of, I guess, multi-stakeholder effort um, over like the 50s and 60s and 70s that we got to the place where it's not perfect, but we've got some sort of social safety net. So long as your model of earning a living is full-time employment, and now the time has come to sort of reconstruct that social safety net, but with a realization that the answer isn't to try and stuff people back into this box of full-time employment that doesn't fit, but to think about who are the stakeholders, like you know, how should the individual participate, how should the platform participate, how should the government participate, how should nonprofits participate? Because there's, there's, um, I, I think there's a really big risk that you know, think about what a country is proud of in terms of signs of progress, right? 
I mean, like, you know, you have laws against child labor, you have like overtime, you have, you know, you don't work seven days a week, you work five days a week. We run the risk of losing this along the way as we transition our employment model unless we are really vigilant. And so that's certainly a downside of the sharing economy, but I think it's broader than that. And, um, you know, I often see the platforms demonized in the conversation about how bad things are for the people who are um, earning a living through them. Um, but the reality is that we have sort of, we have left that world of stability provided by an employer and we have to figure out how to sort of stabilize the new world that we're entering, the world that you guys are entering. So. Great. Well, we wanted to make sure that you have a little bit of time to sort of share your own stories and your own commitments with one another and talk about how some of these issues of the changing nature of work, of the sharing economy, might apply to the work that you're doing or think through how it might impact um, the models that you're working on. Um, so we're going to have about 10 to 15 minutes. I want to encourage you to sort of turn to a few neighbors around you, introduce yourself to them, and talk a little bit about how the conversation we've had up here might translate to your work. So about 10 to 15 minutes for that. We'll walk around, and after that, we'll have time for questions. So stick around. I want to encourage you guys to wrap up your conversations. We're going to take some questions from you in just a couple minutes. So if you guys have questions, um, if you guys have questions, you can go ahead and line up at these two microphones that are at the front. All right. Thanks, guys. We want to try to get you out here on time. We know that President Clinton is speaking next, and you're probably all eager to get there. But we definitely want to be able to answer some questions. So why don't you go ahead and start? And just you know, tell us who you are and sort of where you're from. But ask a question and try to keep it quick so that we can get to a few questions. You got it. Uh, my name is Ryan. I go to Northeastern University. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I was wondering, you spoke about uh, stabilizing the world with this uh, shift to the sharing economy, and I was wondering what you guys thought was the role of government in uh, stabilizing this shift, and whether you force, whether either of you foresee uh, there being public-private partnerships that are sort of crowdsourcing resources such as Uber. Okay. I think we'll take a couple of questions and then answer them. So do you want to go ahead? Hi there, my name is Claire and I'm a student from the University of Toronto. Um, I have a question more directly related to your work, Professor. Um, next semester I'm going to be working with a bank in Canada and they're wondering how the sharing economy can be um, most efficiently taxed uh, by the government um, so that the burden of sort of government services isn't falling to the people who work for the sharing economy, if that makes sense, and more to the corporations. My name's uh, Karan, and I go to Ohio State University, and I was just interested, uh, and I was just interested in hearing um, how you feel technologies like blockchain might be affecting the evolution of the sharing economy. Right, why don't we start with those questions, and we'll, and we'll come to you guys. Um, but we had two questions sort of related to the role of government. Arun, do you want to? Okay, sure. Um, so the, um, the role of government changes significantly. Um, I think that uh, we've gotten used to a world in which um, the government is the de facto or like, you know, the default regulator. Um, we've entered a world now where um, you know, a significant fraction of what used to be done by the government is being done by different digital platforms. Um, we've de facto handed over IP, intellectual property responsibilities in many cases to Amazon and Apple. You know, Google and Facebook have like, you know, unrivaled surveillance capabilities. Um, they're not doing anything sort of nefarious with it, but you know, we've given it to them. And so, um, you know, when, when, when you sort of roll this back into saying, well, like, you know, where does that leave the government? Um, I think that the government still has a role in, you know, sort of setting certain rules. 
um, but they really have to take a step back as being the enforcer and actively delegate responsibility to where the data is. Um, and so to the question about tax collection, for example, like, you know, I am a strong advocate for if participants in a sharing economy platform need to be taxed, um, the responsibility of collecting and remitting the taxes should be delegated to the platform rather than having people sort of register with a city and pay taxes directly. Um, now, in addition to that idea of delegating, um, I think that government should also stop thinking of digital platforms as being the entity to be regulated and instead start thinking of them as partners who can jointly, like, you know, through sort of a public-private partnership in some way, solve the regulatory challenges um, that we're going to face as more and more businesses are individual. And so, um, you know, you've got to be proactive about embracing platform power and sort of working with it. Because, you know, if you look at the example of where we are with, like, Facebook and news filtering, um, we have sort of crossed the point where this can sort of be reined back. Um, you know, a platform that can sway an election isn't going to be effectively regulated by any democratically elected government. And so, um, you, know, you know, thinking about delegation, delegating to where the data is, and being sort of proactive about doing it early in the life of the platform rather than waiting until it's too late. I think those are sort of useful guidelines for government. Then we had a question about technology. I don't know, Diana, if you want to respond at all to that or if you had anything on the governance piece. So that one, the technology question was about technology evolution. Was that what it was? Um, I think it was about blockchain. And uh -huh. so, oh, that's yeah. an interesting, interesting. Um, for blockchain, um, this is a fairly new term for me, actually, but that's one of, say, we've been doing a lot of brainstorming about how to leverage technology to be able to improve the lives of the farm workers. So blockchain technology is something that um, we have someone who's pro bono helping us kind of try to develop, you know, a big challenge is the identity of, of individuals. There's a lot of migratory patterns and people that are um, leaving their home countries to go somewhere else. Um, and some of these platforms, um, sometimes like on Facebook or something, it, it has your name on it, or you know, people are sometimes afraid to post um, things that um, they feel their their privacy or their their identity will be revealed to others. Um, so I think it, it's a, a really interesting way that we're trying to look at uh, block technology to help us figure out how to have like a digital ID for a farm worker regardless of where they are in the world. Um, so to me that's really, really fascinating of what this system is supposed to be really uh, the most secure technology that you can use. So how can we have um, farm workers, for instance, have their different information in the system so that they're able to put all of their different documents, their birth certificates, et cetera, in the system. And when they interact, interact with the UFW Foundation, for instance, where we're helping them on an immigration legal services case, um, that person's going to be able to have access to their data if they get picked up by ICE and get deported, yeah. oftentimes people leave without anything in their wallet, um, not a lot of money, they don't have their documentation that they might, might have left at home or their children's documents because the child has to be with the babysitter. And so you know, actually in, in, in many ways, um, you know, the, the, the vision that you were laying out of um, transparency into like, you know, the production system, mm -hmm transparency into like, you know, sort of what were the labor practices at every step, like, you know, that this food was such. I mean, blockchain technology is sort of potentially incredibly powerful for, for solving that problem. Um, you know, if, if I, I know we want to take more questions, but if I could just add to sort of like a, another dimension to that answer. Um, you know, the, the, uh, a lot of people look at Bitcoin, which is sort of a blockchain-based currency, and say, well, Bitcoin has managed to sort of take out the intermediary completely. 
it's sort of delegated the um, clearing of the transactions to the crowd, right? And this is sort of like you know, innovative and exciting. Can we do this for Uber? Can we do this for Airbnb? Can we sort of live in a world where there are no intermediaries? I don't think so for two reasons. One is because, um, you know, uh, it's going to take at least a generation for us to get used to the idea of not having a branded entity who is sort of sitting between us and whoever we're transacting with. Um, blah, blah, car, Uber, Airbnb, Lyft. They're all like using digital trust, but they've also got brand. And the other is that intermediaries serve a purpose sometimes. You know, clearing a financial transaction is much easier than, you know, sort of facilitating the logistics and payment and trust associated with delivering something or providing transportation or providing accommodation. So it'll challenge them, but I don't think it's going to replace them. And to the person who asked about taxes, I have a much longer answer, but I don't want to sort of take up more time, so I mean, feel free to sort of send me email or contact me, because that's, that's sort of a complex issue, like, you know, how do you balance the burden of tax between the providers and the platform and the sharing economy? Great. Hi, to... yep. Um, so you talked about one of the big downsides of the sharing economy is workers' workers' rights, uh, but uh, another downside seems to be job security, that people have fears of income security, especially when they have children, you know, fluctuations in if they're just an Uber driver, it can go up and down so much, they don't have this income security. What, what ways do you think this can be approached? I know in Europe, they're talking a lot about a universal basic income. You know, a lot of countries, they already have universal free healthcare, free education, and so they go basic income. Can you think of uh, other ways or alternatives to that where people can know they have in income security uh, if they're living in this fluctuating um, cash flow sort of sharing economy world. Thanks. Hi, my name is Ashwin and I'm from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, you talked about trust laws and uh, the role of intermediaries in the sharing economy. Uh, but however, uh, I feel, I mean, my question is, what is the political will uh, to introduce regulations to try and uh, get the sharing economy on the same uh, platform and trying to, uh, you know, negate the role of intermediaries as it is today. Um, and next, you, talk, you talked about uh, trust issues. Um, and one of the common problems that we see, uh, I've heard about Airbnb model is that there is no uh, you know, vetting of the, uh, uh, the rentals or the apartment places where people uh, put their apartments up. So what, how would you, you know, try and address s such issues, basically? Hello, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Alvin, and I go to school at Trinity University. So my question is particularly re with regards to the redistribution of income, as it pertains to the main driver of, I, I believe, the sharing economy, which is the information extracted from all the transactions going on that allows for all these massive data houses to immerse a lot of power that you're going to issue to be the moderators of this sharing economy. How does the, since that the data is really the main driver of this economy, how do we deal with the redistribution of income from that data? Because then it's causing companies like Google, Facebook, Uber to just literally grow massively. And you just have a few people in these, country, in these companies um, having all the income. But then the providers of that information that is driving and making their business model possible aren't getting any of the benefits. And how does that pertain to the sustainability <coughs> of the entire economy? I, I, can, I can take a stab at the first and the third question, um, and I'll, I'll leave the second one to you, because it's, 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 a, it's a harder one. Um, so, you know, if you think about it, uh, someone who has a full-time job and gets a steady salary um, is not putting in the same amount of work every day or every week. Sometimes they're on vacation, sometimes they have an off day, sometimes they have a great day. Um, but we created a model of insurance, in a sense, that became standardized, where the employer sort of like, you know, said, well, you know, your value to me may be fluctuating, but I'm going to stabilize because you need stability. Um, so once you think of income stability as a form, as an insurance product, um, there is a relatively straightforward path to having someone other than the employer provide this insurance. Um, it'll be a little more expensive because the employer has a long-term relationship with the employee and so can actually 
provide this insurance at a lower cost. But you know, I've seen a number of startups that have tried to come up with income stabilizing products for Uber drivers, for example. Um, I know that there's a lot of excitement around universal basic income. Um, I have many friends who are very strong proponents. I teach a course at NYU with Albert Wenger, who's a partner at Union Square Ventures. He's a big proponent. Natalie Foster and Andy Stern, they're all, you know. Now, I don't believe that universal basic income is a good idea. Um, and, you know, it has nothing to do with motivation. I think people with a basic income will be as motivated, if not more. Um, but it's, it's, it's two reasons. One is that for a universal basic income to actually have a meaningful impact on someone's perception of future stability, um, it has to be substantial. And so to put some numbers into context, like if every person in the United States of working age had to get $1,000 a month as a universal basic income, we're looking at something close to a $3 trillion a year expenditure. Okay, so that would be like a little over half of the federal budget, It'd be more than Social Security and Medicaid put together. Okay, so it's, it's, it's an extremely large program. Um, now, you could say, well, productivity will go up, raise taxes, and let's sort of make this happen. But my deeper objection is somehow this doesn't seem like enough to ask of government to simply take and redistribute. Um, my conception of government is one where, like, you know, this is an institution that can do more with what they collect. They can solve public goods problems. And so simply being a redistributor um, doesn't seem like, I, I feel like that's, where we're sort of not giving government enough responsibility. If you can muster the political will to sort of create a two and a half trillion dollar, like, you know, sort of welfare program, then you can do a lot better than universal basic income. And um, so that's, that's, that's why I am not a sort of an ardent sort of advocate for it. Um, that final question was... Um, it was about uh, redistributing income yes. based around information. Perfect. I mean, like, you know, so, um, you know, I alluded to this um, earlier in the panel that, uh, you know, there are, you know, the... Stability of someone's employment model is getting, or like, you know, work model is, um, is, is, is going down. More and more people do not have full-time jobs. They instead have these sort of contingent work arrangements. Um, that's how we're arranging the world's economic activity. And in parallel, um, advances in digital technology are increasing the ease with which capital can be substituted for labor the ease with which things can be automated. This isn't new, this happened during the Industrial Revolution, it happened at the turn of the 20th century with farming, um, it happened in the 1970s in the United States with manufacturing, it's happening in China now with manufacturing. Machines automate human labor, new demand for human labor is created. The thing is that once you put these two things together, um, the only solution I see for lowering inequality is to favor platform models that are genuinely decentralizing ownership of part of the capital. Because, you know, the idea that you can make a living as a provider of labor and talent in exchange for a salary, um, that's going to be a thing of the past for a lot of people. And the only way in which a lot of people are gonna be able to earn money is if they actually hold capital, structural capital, like an Airbnb host holds structural capital. They set prices, they manage inventory, they merchandise, they build a brand, they hire people to sort of like, you know, so, so you need to have that tiny business. So as the labor starts to get automated, there's something left behind for the individual to hold on to. And so every government I talk to today, the sort of most important message I leave them with regarding the sharing economy is that favor the platform models that are genuinely decentralizing the ownership of capital and don't favor the ones that are converting the workforce into anonymous on-demand labor, because that will exacerbate inequality, whereas the decentralization of the means of production will actually reduce inequality over time. Great, so we've got about two minutes left. So Diana, if you wanna give sure. um, some concluding thoughts and, and if you have a call to action or some advice for our audience here, that would be great. And then sure. Erin, I'll give you about 30 seconds after she's done. So I think just speaking a little bit to the 
trust question and you know how government is looking at rentals. Um, we have a lot of power as consumers. And so I think it's, it's um, the, the interesting thing about the shared economy is that as a consumer in a lot of these different platforms, you're able to provide feedback about good actors, bad actors, um, in the sense on, in the social justice mind frame where we're talking about farm workers actually providing feedback about how they're treated, what are the conditions on the ground. You know, there's, there's a lot of help there with the regulation of how um, things are being done. So whereas a government agency can come in to um, fields to check to see what the conditions are, they can't go to visit 500,000 workers that are in the, in the ag industry in California, it's physically impossible for them to do it, especially because they're t they tend to be isolated areas. So there is a unique opportunity for us as consumers, for individuals on the ground who um, are participants in this shared economy to provide information um, to be able to leverage that data so that um, those who are providing a service or are employing someone behave better, can pay better, et cetera. So I think it's a really, really unique opportunity for us to really look at how, how we look as a consumer at all of these different um, things that we can do to ensure that we know what we are consuming, how are people being treated, and that transparency of, hey, can we find out more information about how there is more equity in this specific platform? So the curiosity there of how to deal with that issue is really important. Do you have one final thought for us, Aaron? Um, well, go forth and make the world a better place, I guess. Um, no, but think, think um, as, as, as you're thinking about um, that too, I mean, um, but as, as you're thinking about your commitments, um, try and borrow ideas from this new way of organizing economic activity. Because, um, you know, the reason why I work for a business school and not a public policy school, um, or, you know, sort of a different school, is because um, I believe that, um, you know, whatever its deficiencies, business can be a powerful agent of social change. Um, and ideas from business can like, you know, inform efforts to sort of change the world, even if the businesses don't directly. And so, you know, it's, it's um, you know, if you think through, like, you know, sort of what are the innovative dimensions of these businesses that we've talked about today as being part of the sharing economy, and say, what are the pieces of what they're doing that might apply to what I've proposed doing? Um, I think that you might find that, like, you know, it, it may change the direction of what you are trying to do or it may improve it. I'm also going to take a picture of you guys because I take a picture of all my audiences. Um, so I want you all to smile, wave, like, you know. I don't post these on any social, well, I may, my, I may tweet it, but, and this is because I figure I'll have grandkids one day and they won't listen to me and so I'll show them pictures <laughs> and you know, say, see, people used to gather. All right, well. Arun and Diana, thank you so much for your time. So why don't you join me in thanking them? And thank all of you for joining us for this discussion.